You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the next uh, two episodes of Star Trek Prodigy Ascension, parts one and two. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Jason Tyler. Hey, Father. Hello. And Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Uh, folks, be sure to stick around to the end. We have more listener feedback to share with you. Also, if you're not yet doing so, follow The Secrets of Star Trek. We're in Apple Podcasts. We're in Spotify. Tune in your favorite podcast app. You can also watch us on YouTube, where you should make sure to hit the bell to get notifications. And, of course, subscribe. And another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy, which is very topical right now, is The Secrets of Middle Earth which you can find wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Middle Earth. But today we're talking about Star Trek Prodigy. And Jimmy, can you give us a recap of Ascensions Part 1 and 2? This week we get a whole bunch of reminders and updates now that the kids are back on Voyager. But the plot starts when Admiral Jellico orders Voyager and the Protostar back to Earth so that the temp Department of Temporal Investigations can take over the pro getting the Protostar back in time to Tars Lamora, which actually makes sense. So you know a huge plot complication is about to intervene to stop the plot from being taken out of our hero's hands. That plot complication emerges when Gwen's father makes contact and tells her that Essencia has abolished the Council on Solemn and assumed power. What's more, she's using advanced time-based technology to build a war fleet super fast by enclosing shipyards in fields that accelerate time. Essencia then breaks into the transmission and says she's learned Voyager's coordinates through it, so she sends a monster-sized evil ship to destroy Voyager. We then get a long and, for once, interesting space battle. The enemy ship disables Voyager with an energy dampening weapon and also starts attacking the Protostar, and it releases an army of drone flyers. Voyager mounts a shuttle defense with Red Squad and Dal, who has been training with Red Squad. Chakotay and most of the or Nova Squad. Chakotay and most of the kids take control of the Protostar, but Zero, whose body is failing, stays on Voyager. Janeway gets Voyager's quantum torpedoes back online, but the enemy ship is preventing them from getting the coordinates they need to use them. So they execute a complex plan where Nova Squad distracts the drone flyers while the Protostar gets close enough to the enemy ship to get the needed coordinates. It looks like the plan's going to work, but when Janeway fires the torpedoes, the drones create an energy shield protecting their mothership. Back on Solemn, Asensia is delighted and she gloats to her captive, Wesley Crusher, whose mind she has tapped to get all of her new time-based technology. In part two, the space battle continues and Essencia fires a time bomb into Voyager Shuttle Bay 3. It is literally a time bomb, that is, a bomb that accelerates time, so anyone who approaches it ages at a fantastic rate. Zero decides to sacrifice his current body since he's a Medusan and doesn't age the way organics do. He struggles to shut off the time bomb, but he can't, however, he figures out how to direct it to another ship. Majel tells him to lock it onto her flyer, and she and the rest of Nova Squad then fly so close to the enemy ship that the time bomb impacts it and destroys it. Afterward, Zero gets a new encounter suit that looks just like his old one but has sensory inputs. Janeway announces that, given the impending war with Solemn, Admiral Jellico has realized the need for a fleet presence there, and since Starfleet is spread so thin, he assigns Voyager and the Protostar to go there. Back on Solemn, Wesley gloats to Essentia, but she gloats back, noting that uh, nobody came to Voyager's defense during the battle, and that means Starfleet must be spread super thin and completely unprepared for what comes next. The end. Whew. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Father Jason, your uh, overall impression of this one? I really enjoyed these episodes. Uh, I agree with uh, Jimmy's comment that it's a, we had a space battle that was interesting more than, than some of the other ones we have sometimes on Star Trek. And uh, I thought the story moved along well. It's interesting to see the idea of a, a traveler taken captive and what, what that can do in terms of, of damage to things. So, yeah. Jimmy, how about you? Yeah, I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I would. Um, 
of the two episodes, part one opens with a several minutes long series of just basic updates to remind people of stuff and tie up little things. And then when the plot starts moving, I'm thinking, oh, great, another space battle, which on Star Trek are kind of like car chases. You know, not a lot tends to happen until the end of the battle. Um but this time it was interesting. It went on a really long time and it had a bunch of phases that you could follow. It wasn't just people standing over consoles talking dramatically, although there was some of that. Um, but I thought they did a good job. I was thinking about space battles and, you know, I, Star Trek space battles, I don't think are the best. Um, they And especially since the end of Deep Space Nine, they've just been shoving as many ships on the screen as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no real drama because you don't have a plot you can really follow. At some point, someone just says, punch me a hole through there, and they do. Um, in, so Babylon 5 space battles, I think, were a step up because they frequently focused on the maneuvers of individual ships and they would do things like ramming each other and stuff. I think the best space battles I've seen are Battlestar Galactica, yeah. um, where they would even show you, here is our attack plan, you know, using mm -hmm. a tabletop set of models, and then you get to watch it and see how it goes right and wrong. So I thought this was a step up for Star Trek in terms of space battle presentation. And Star Wars has historically done a pretty good job of space battles too. I think, mm -hmm. um, e even like in um, thinking like uh, Rogue One, you know the the big the big battle there. You get it. You, you can keep an, a sense of what's overall going on. It's so hard because so much is flying around and stuff, and it's easy to get lost in it. And yeah. and it's it's a tricky tricky thing to do. Yeah, like it, 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 at the end of um, season one of strange new worlds you know they have that space battle where kirk shows up with an enormous fleet of ships piloted entirely by him yeah and there's just okay all you're doing is shoving stuff on the screen there's yeah, i'm yeah. not going to get any sense of tactics out of this mm -hmm. right right yeah yeah i think around the, it was at the end of season two of discovery that they actually had uh, you know, several shuttlecraft that were involved, uh, you know, kind of on both sides mm -hmm. of a fight. And that's something that, you know, we haven't seen too terribly often uh, on Star Trek. We see it uh, in a different way here as well with the drones mm -hmm. on the one side and the Nova squad on the other. And that's probably more of how some of these things would go rather than just having the, you know, capital ships, capital ships from the, the two mm -hmm. different sides fighting it out. You'd have the, the uh, shuttlecraft effectively doing what, aircraft taking off for, from an aircraft carrier would do in, in a naval battle mm -hmm. nowadays. Yeah, I've always thought that Star Trek should have fighters and you should have carriers with fighters, just like, you know, Star Wars, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, that it wouldn't just be capitalism because, the, you know, each one has different, as we see, different benefits. The little, the little ships are harder to hit and that sort of thing, and they maneuver faster and that sort of stuff. So I, I agree with that. I, I also really like these two episodes. I think... I, the, there was plenty of action. It felt like it moved right along. There was that beginning part where we're, you know, we're kind of catching up. It's sort of a catching our breath before the rush to the end because we only got a few episodes left of the season, and and I thought that was good. And it, I felt like during the action sequences there was character development. There was, uh, you, you know, d uh, we move forward with people. There was risks. There was uh, a failure. You know, where you know where they try a thing. It wasn't just you know, so, you know, Zero's going to go fix this and does it. it no, they, that doesn't work. So we have to try something else. And, you know, so everybody's involved. There is no uh, single failure point. Like you, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, recently, Jimmy, you know, it, it's just no single point of failure. Um, and so I thought it was, I thought it was well written and well executed uh, yeah. as a story. So I, I really enjoyed that. That was one thing I appreciated about it. There's even, they, there's a line at the end where they talk about the nature of the victory where Janeway after the battle says there was no single hero or savior. Instead, we were carried by many smaller acts of bravery as we fought for each other. And mm -hmm. I thought that is exactly what we just saw. Mm -hmm. We there, nobody was the hero who saves the day. Everybody was working together. It reminded me of a, um, 
of a graphic novel I read a number of years ago called Golden Age, which was about the golden age of DC comic book heroes. It was set in an alternate universe, but they have to fight a real big villain at the end of it. And one of the, I, I saw a comment by one of the writers who, who had, by the writer who had done this, and he commented on how at the climax of a lot of comic book plots, there's like one big punch that takes out the enemy which I guess even led to the creation of one punch man. But, um, hmm. but, but, you know, you tend to, it all tends to build up to one single act and he deliberately went the other way in golden age where the hero is not, the villain is not taken out by one punch from some hero. It's a death of a thousand cuts. And so you get this longer battle where everybody's doing a little bit of damage and they're having reversals and setbacks and it's so much more satisfying. Right. Right. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, when you, it's, it's harder to write, that's for sure, but it's more satisfying to, to have all of your cast, all of your heroes. And, and it's, this, there's a lot of times, especially in novels where they have these action sequences and they end just abruptly because one put like the equivalent of one punch, whatever that it happens to be in that story. And Turn it's like, on the it's unsatis- yeah. Yeah. And it's just unsatisfying. I'm like, no, you built up to this throughout this whole, whole story. Spend a lot of time. And then, Oh, we've run out of time or pages or whatever. And now we have to like resolve it. I, I, don't, I don't think it's space limitations that uh, that cause it. I think it's a writing flaw. I was watching an interview, I believe it was with John Le Carre, the spy novelist, mm-hmm. who um, he was being asked, what have you learned since you started writing? You know, what techniques have you changed with? And he said, well, one thing that he learned was um, if there is a conflict between a physical fight between two characters, it must go on for as long as possible because right. if you in in spy fiction when you get to that physical fight you've been building up to it for a long time and it needs to pay off and have heft and previously in his work um he would have uh you know just a couple of you know he threw a punch and that would be it and so he decided to make lists of everything that he could think of that could happen in the fight and use them and would have much longer final fights. And I said, yeah, that's right. And so even though I haven't written fiction in years, I adopted that principle. And so if I'm writing up towards a climactic battle, I do the same thing. I make a list of everything I can think of that could happen in this context, in this fight, and then I use it all. Mm. So we mentioned, we mentioned that uh, early on was sort of a, recap of this of what's where we are in the story uh, you know that the beginning of the first part and one of the things we have is is uh gwyn giving a personal uh, journal she you know her personal log and she says something that i thought was interesting it's a bit sums up a bit how gwyn has changed which is she says maybe home isn't always a place it's the people you trust the most because gwyn who was never born on solemn and had only recently ever been there had identified herself as, you know, of on the cot, you know, someone from Solomon. Solomon was her home. And she's over time, I think, come to appreciate. And I think this is going to be part of the resolution of the story. I think that her home is among the rest of the protostar crew. Mm-hmm. You know, if we remember back to the beginning of the season, she was the only one who wasn't with them. She was the only one who wasn't at the prep school for the Starfleet Academy with the rest. She was off to Solomon. And so I think it shows this shift in Gwyn that we're going to, as you know, in the resolution, she's going to end up staying with the Protostar crew instead of going back to Solom. I think, or or she'll be at least given this choice. She's going to have to make this decision between them, but it's going to be, um, you know, this idea that these people are her home. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I thought that was uh, interesting the way for them to start the episode. By the way, one note that you just reminded me of, I like the fact that the planet is called Solemn, but the people from the planet are called the Valnakat, mm. um, because that's how it is here. We're on planet Earth, but we're humans. Uh, right. I, I know in some fiction we're Terrans or Earthers, but the way we actually talk in real life is we're humans and we're from the planet Earth. 
as opposed to, oh, Vulcans come from Vulcan and Organians come from Organia and Klingons, come, well, they come from Kronos now. But yeah, um, I, I appreciate having the name of the species and the name of the planet be different. We also got good character development with Dahl because um, <laughs> yes. he is he is seems to be over his uh yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's not completely, but he seems to be over his, you know, lusting for the captaincy of his of his little group. He in these in this episode and in the next episode, which we'll talk about next time, he steps back and lets other people take leadership roles without trying to inject himself in. Next episode, he's going to step back and just let Gwen take the leadership role. Mm-hmm. This episode, he steps back and lets Majel take the ep- mm-hmm. take the role. He's fine with temporal investigations taken over this and let the professionals do it instead of us kids. So he's really, he's really, he's really matured a lot. I agree. Yeah. That was a, a, something I noticed in him. Um, you know, Magell invites him to fly with Nova squadron in this you know crisis. And he's willing to take the, the third seat. Cause um, their Brom, regular third gets injured. Yeah. yeah. Who I realize now is a Lurian like mm-hmm. Morn. Yep, and right. thus doesn't have any lines. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to comment, you know, but oh, it's time to cut the chit chat or whatever. You know, yeah. they, they, it's the mm-hmm. same kind of thing we had with Morn. You know, he, he never speaks on screen, but uh, people act like he's talking all the time off screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I like that they continue the gag. That's a, yeah. that's a good gag. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, I have a possible prediction. So we got that glimpse mm-hmm. of, uh, of Dal's future where he's telling Gwen that chair was never mine. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, we assume at the time it's the captain's chair, but I said of something, but I, I, I said, I, I suspect there's going to be a recontextualization that makes it different than what we're expecting. I now think mm-hmm. we have a candidate for what that chair could be. It's a seat on Nova squadron. Mm. Mm. Interesting. That, he yeah, may like find his find his place and fit in and feel like he's fitting in, but then nope. It, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I, I I find how they're treating Nova Squadron to be kind of a bit odd because you know, Nova Squadron was was a flight team like an athletic team from Starfleet Academy originally when TNG, and now it's like something else. I, it's kind of I don't know like what it's what they're making it out to be like sometimes they refer to it in a way that makes it its own entity uh, in a sense well i think it's i mean it's still part of starfleet academy it's just they've got these kids on ships who are part of it Mm -hmm. and they're an elite and they've actually had a precedent for that on deep space nine where they found a defiant class ship that had um that was crewed by another group called uh, elite group called red squad yeah. And um and the mm-hmm. the adult Starfleet captain of the ship had been killed. And so the kids, even though it was a training voyage, just had to step up and keep running the ship. And so they do they do at least have precedent for putting academicians, you know, academy members on serving ships in some circumstances. Yeah, yeah. And we the US Navy does it now, like in the summer between years you know, the, that the uh, naval academy they, they they put them on active duty ships to experience life on mm-hmm. board uh the, it's just a magella at one point when they, they have to like not be in starfleet and i think i think that's actually the next episode so, but yeah. um uh she says i've resigned from nova squadron and somehow that makes her not starfleet so i just thought it was like an uh an odd way of putting mm-hmm. it but uh um, but in any case um uh, the, the the another thing that comes up in that pre part was that is a doctor talking about zero's new body, and originally where the 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 way he refers to it is, is that they're going to get like a daystrom android body is I think that's how we the, the daystrom would provide a design uh, based on the body that zero has now the body would be permanent you know with all the good and the bad feelings uh, that you know that you could have. But it would be more permanent. But that's not what we end up with because of the emergency, I think. Well, the doctor also says, though, it can be any form you choose. And then they drop that and don't tell us what form he chooses so they can have the mm. reveal at the end. Yeah. Oh, OK. So the 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 return to the previous design was all along. Oh, OK. I, I didn't catch that. So 
So I thought maybe it was he was going to go for a more human looking design and ended up going with the uh, or humanoid looking design and ended up going with what he uh, what he did just out of necessity. But I could see that. OK. Yeah. Also. Um, so here's where um, now that you brought it up, here's a here's a flaw with the episode is he wants Jankum to be in charge of building the new body. Yeah. It's like. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. Jankum may be a good engineer, but he's a kid. If I'm, right. if I'm getting my new phone made, I want Apple engineers doing it. I don't want some teenager <laughs> doing it. Yeah. yeah. Or if, if you get surgery you. coming up, you want the experienced doctor, not the med student. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another flaw, by the way, and, and even though the space battle was really interesting, I, I did think it had some flaws. Um, one of them is... They're right in front of this ship and the big monster evil alien ship that never gets a name. And Rev one, actually, I think okay. it was called. Okay. Yeah. And Janeway gets her quantum torpedoes online, which is more people talking about in dramatically in, while in front of consoles. Mm -hmm. But then she can't fire them at the ship that's right in front of her. <laughs> So I they've, too. they've got yeah. to they've got to get a ship closer to get coordinates, and they have an explanation for it. It's like it's throwing off too much chroniton energy or something, and that's interfering with their targeting system. But um, yeah, okay, this is not this is not real world here. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it did lead to a nice overall solution. It's just a weak point in the write-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there, there was a scene with Janeway and Chakotay where they're uh, recalling the final episode of Voyager. Mm -hmm. That was yep. interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, where she notes like the the future Janeway who came back uh, to send them home, you know, came from the future. And Janeway says, "Funny, I look a lot like her now." Is that going to happen in this uh, story? I wonder if if, uh, probably if they're not. intimating that, that that it's that's that Janeway is soon. Maybe. But, it would be. I don't think they will because it would be an unhappy ending because that Janeway dies. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, it, but it also may be intimating that this Janeway doesn't have long. Uh, so. uh, no, I don't think so. This is a kid show. They're going to have a happy ending for Janeway. By the way, speaking of Janeway, I really did like one line. So we've got two Janeways now. We've got biological Janeway in charge of Voyager, mm -hmm. and we've got hollow Janeway over on the Protostar. And there's at the beginning of the space battle, hollow Janeway is all alone on the Protostar, mm -hmm. and it's under attack from the evil enemy ship. And... Um, I love how I'm saying that the ship itself is evil, <laughs> um, but uh, but we get this great line where Hollow Janeway hails Voyager's hails Voyager and says Janeway to Janeway, and it's like okay, <laughs> that's just fine. Yep. Although again, I, as I saw that, I thought, did they really leave the Protostar with no crew on board? You know, it seems like they could have put Chakotay and a few others there to to help pilot the thing along or whatever, or at least be there in case of. An emergency like what wound up happening. I, I think it was just, some binars uh, there. Yeah, oh, the binars there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they do have binars in the crew. I noticed that. I didn't notice if they were on yeah. Voyager. I would just assume. I mean, these are complex computerized ships. I would mm -hmm. assume that they just slaved Protostar to Voyager's navigation system and and had it fly yeah. parallel. Yeah, yeah, but in, as it was in the opening montage, there was like they were mm. talking about the 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 weapon, the solemn weapon, and that they and w while talking about that, they showed the the binars they're working on it. So mm -hmm. I would guess the crew were going back and forth, you mm -hmm. know, regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jimmy, you characterized Jellico's decision uh, as logical. Yeah, um, I mean, let, let, let temporal investigations handle this. You got to reinsert this thing into the time stream into the past to fix it. That's a yeah. job for pros. See, I thought at the time that it was illogical hmm. uh, in the sense of if Starfleet is spread so thin, why have them bring the protostar all the way back to Earth to deal with it instead of letting them just finish the job while they're out there? Because because time machine. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You don't have to worry about time. You can take all the time you need to get back to Earth. You don't have to fix the job immediately. It's better to do it right. Right. Okay. That, I guess that does make sense. Um, and it may be better to have Voyager near Earth to hit, deal with whatever's going on. You know, that's got Starfleet spread so thin. You know, they, they mentioned a couple things. The Romulan evacuation and the um, whatever else. Oh, uh, the 
some of the ships having been damaged or destroyed by the living construct, you know, in uh, mm-hmm. season one. So right, right. I got to say, Ronnie Cox's voice, you can tell how much older he is these days. <laughs> and I was thinking about that as, as he was speaking. I'm like, you know, what a great character he is uh, uh, in, in both in Stargate and in Star Trek. Um, and he played so, the banjo in Deliverance. <laughs> That's right. Wow, that goes way back. I mean, he's uh, in I, dueling banjos. He's the he's one of the two banjos. Right, right. That's true. Um I do want to note, as the uh, ship guy on the panel, the that the Nova two, the Nova Mark two flyers were designed by Tom Paris. Yeah, uh, presumably using what he learned about the Delta flyer. So that was kind of cool. I did like that. Um, so let's talk about uh, the tra- Wesley and uh, you know the reveal that Essencia has captured him. Uh, we don't know how in this st- episode. We will learn that uh, in the next one, but. Um, but she's captured him, and she's using some technology to 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 read his mind and to to get all this information about this futuristic time technology that she's using to advance the von Lakat tech. Yeah, it's and they're not really clear on this either. This episode or next, what the tech is? She's got him in in a like chamber, and she's got some kind of device on him. Mm. Um, and they don't. I don't think they're clear on is this like just torture or is it mind reading or is it mind reading and torture or exactly what's going on with it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, although, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that later, but the, the, the because they get more into that uh, later. Yeah. Um, so, but she's using it to, to do this presumably automated advanced shipbuilding, which is, I think is a fascinating idea is like these mm-hmm. bubbles of, of, accelerated time where they can build a ship that would take months in days. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting to, to, to see that. Um, speaking of ships, the, 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 the big enemy ship, which I think is called Rev one, um, reminds me a lot of the Narada mm-hmm, in the yep. Kelvin track. I was yep. even the same the, thing, the way it emerged from the time dis, uh, distortion, whatever. Um, I, I wonder if that was intentional. We oh, yeah. are we evoking that because that was also emerging from a time traveling space anomaly or whatever. Um, yeah, no, I think that was a del- deliberate visual callback to the movie. Okay. Um, yeah, there was, by the way, um, continuity error. I think. I think you guys can tell me if, if I'm off. Uh, Counselor Noom, 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 Noom. Mm-hmm. the Noom, the Tellerite. They kept showing him on the bridge and in sick bay during mm-hmm. the battle. Like, like he's mm. is is he running back and forth? I mean, it it. I feel like it was a, there's a bit of a continuity error, just a small thing, um, in in there. Just one of the you know an error that you just by the absence of other errors, it's it's noticeable to me. Um, and what is interesting is they risk the protostar to save Voyager. The protostar mm-hmm. is is vital to fixing everything you've got to protect this ship to get it to tars lamora that's the when it comes down to it and yet they get to this point where they have to chicote and the crew aboard that have to they've been told you know stay out of the battle but voyage is overmatched and they need to to bring it in and so they they are risking everything including gwyn mm-hmm. uh to, so, so it, I think it highlights how desperate the situation is, how desperate the battle is, and uh, in, in that Chico- you know that Chakotay can't just stand by and watch Voyager get battered into 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 submission. So yeah. I thought that was a interesting aspect to the desperation of this, and that's one of the things I like is when you you take these battles, you take the, your heroes to the point of desperation to you know. They've got to go all in. I mean, that's what I think makes the most interesting sorts of these battles is by the, the heroes have to commit everything to, to, to save, to win. Not so, every battle, but that needs to be part of the mix. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because if every battle uh, was like that, they'd all be the same and they'd, they would end up being boring. You need, sure, you need sure. peaks and valleys of drama. Yeah. Yeah. 
By the way, so, uh, speaking of the battle, so there are a couple of things that uh, on a tactical level that, that I thought were interesting. One of them is when when Janeway finally gets her quantum torpedoes back online and is going to fire them and succeeds in firing them after she gets the coordinates. Um, the what the way the ship defends itself is another visual callback. I think it uh, it, it I'm sure. It what the drones of the ship do is they start forming energy filaments between them to create a force field to protect the ship, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, this is the Tholian web defense. Mm -hmm. um, because we've had a couple of uh, there's one of them is the Tholian web, and there's another which is the big space curtain that Q creates in Encounter oh, yeah. at Farpoint. Mm -hmm. where there's like a net-like structure in space that you can't fly through, even though there are big holes between the the, <laughs> the the filaments the net is made of. And so you just have to assume there's a force field there. And that's what they make that clear here, where the quantum torpedoes hit the force field and you can see them scatter. There's, there's also a move that is a callback it's it's a new move, but it's a it's a callback to the original Nova Squad episode of um, Next Gen, where no the thing that got Nova Squad in trouble when Wesley Crusher was part of it, and when Proto Tom Paris was part of it, <laughs> is um, they were trying to pull off some kind of starburst maneuver. I forget exactly what they called it, but mm -hmm. it was very dangerous, and one of their members died. And here, Nova Squad is practicing something called the Boothby Supernova, which is, of course, named after Boothby, my favorite Martian, who, um, <laughs> I mean, they they need to establish that Ray, Ray Walston's character was born a human born on Mars. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but uh, the gardener at Starfleet Academy. So I guess he was, he impressed some flyers so much. They named a, a maneuver after him that they came up with. And instead of a starburst, it's a supernova. So Boothby supernova, but they say no one has ever done it before. And so they're going to fly towards the evil alien ship and do this maneuver to get the time bomb, which they call the incursor to crash in to the, mothership and i'm like why why do why do you need to do this fancy move no one's ever done before why does Majel need two other guys with her why didn't she if it's locked on her she can just fly towards the ship miss and hope the thing hits so right. i'm not sure why I'm, it, it's it's a nice callback i'm just on a from a writing perspective i'm just not sure it's like it's fully justified mm -hmm. The original maneuver was the Colvord Starburst. So yeah. now it's the, but now Starburst is a candy, so you can't use that probably. I don't know. Uh, but you the, could. Yeah, the, um, yeah, you're right about Magell. I mean, they had, they had to have, they were practicing the maneuver on the holodeck. So, you know, Chekhov's space maneuver, you had to do it in the, in the show itself. But uh, yeah, the whole point of the, of the trick that you know that tricked the incursor was they eject the basically the cockpit section of the nova flyer and it follows the other part you know the aft section into the into the ship you know, the, mm -hmm. the rev one yeah and it is and that's the whole idea but you're right like the, the doll and the other guy were completely you know um <laughs> irrelevant to, to that but yeah you know oh well uh you know it, it created some drama but you're right you're right um it's interesting. Essentia makes the classic uh, supervillain mistake, which is to toy with your enemy instead of just killing them. Mm -hmm. You know, she she could have at any point have used the the this this device or the ship to just destroy Voyager, destroy the Protostar, and move on to destroying Starfleet. But she she wants to toy with them to make them suffer. And you know, this is the whole point of the Incursor is it's a slow death. It's a slow moving weapon that ages you little by little and and also somehow a, explodes yeah it's, <laughs> and it's yeah well maybe the, it ages the antimatter containment pods to the point where they collapse or something but uh, but it, it's like it it feels 
I don't know. It's a kid show at, at heart, I know. So we didn't. We need to have the supervillains acting like supervillains. But, you know, just once I want a villain who's just going to... And I've seen this before, who just says, uh, uh, you know, it's like The Incredibles. Mm-hmm. Oh, you almost caught me monologuing. <laughs> no, you're just going to die, you know, just to, to, to do the thing. Um it, it was a bit of a trope and it was a little annoying and, and including the fact that in the end where they've got the incursor heading back to rev one essentially is just standing there watching them get out of this trap that she set and she doesn't do anything she doesn't have the the robot that's piloting the rev one or anything she just stands there which is i think another writing flaw in it you know that they just oh they've they figured out how to how to get out of my trap, and I'm just going to watch them do it. Well, I don't know. I'd, ha- I'd have to rewatch it, but um, I think that you know she's kind of sh- she's kind of shot her wad at that point. You know, she's she's used her big gun. She's she's hit him with the incursor. She only has one incursor on this ship. There's not a lot mm. left for her to do at that point. If they found a way to defeat it, yeah, crash into. Voyager, you know, or, you know, I mean, there's, there's things, you know, I, I suppose other things you could do, but I guess it, just, yeah, it felt like she, yeah. the, the way the incursor works, though, even though it seems slow from inside its time acceleration field from outside, this is all happening super fast. I guess so. Yeah. Um, so zero, we have um, sacrifices from Zero, who is going to sacrifice the body that's failing, you know, they'll be it, it's failing, but, uh, you know, recognizes that the body that was manufactured is just a carrier. So, you know, it's not... It's just like another it, like encounter it, suit. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not like us, which we are embodied spirits. We are both body and spirit, as you well know, uh, so that if our body dies, we die. But for, for Zero, the body is just a suit you know that you're wearing and the, the what's really uh, zero is the energy field that makes it up um mm-hmm. that is inside it so i guess you know it well it's kind of interesting and you know that he's suffering as to do this but in the end you know zero's not going to die from this as he tells right. us right up front he's not going to die from it so it does take a little bit of the drama out of his personal sacrifice but nevertheless there's there's some sacrifice going on in there Whereas Magell, she's she's like pointed at me, aiming at me. I'm willing to sacrifice myself. There's, there was no guarantee she'd survive this encounter with the Incursor, which I thought was interesting. You know, for her that was a logical conclusion uh, that it should lock onto her, not into the end of the others, but to her. So I thought that was uh, Wesley interesting. Will, Wesley yeah. will be very unhappy when he learns about that. <laughs> yeah. well she she makes the logical leap that mm-hmm. maybe the reason she was he said she had to stay with them was for this yeah for this but yeah. it turns out not yeah so uh, there's also another problem on the science level with this um so the reason that um that the time bomb works is it accelerates aging and it, it, i'm sorry it accelerates time which has mm-hmm. on organics the effect of aging them really fast. And it's clear that's how it works, because this is the same technology she's using to accelerate her shipyards. So you can get a mm-hmm. ship built pronto. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we're when Zero is actually trying to, to defuse the bomb, they're treating it like it's increasing aging without speeding up time. Because um, he's talking to like Rock and Magell and stuff, mm-hmm. and there's no time differential. It's not like, oh, I just heard a little noise. Let's play that back slower. What did what 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 did Zero right. just say? Yeah. Um. So they're they're fudging about how this thing works. Right, because we've seen Voyager episodes specifically where there's a time differential between two places and yeah how does yeah. how's that work like, yeah like the super, just be- super fast planet episode mm-hmm. right right so it shouldn't just be aging quickly it should be time going quickly yeah um and we see tysis actually although they say they'll be able to reverse the effects on tysis so um, yeah you know, that's a couple of weeks of some therapy he'll be okay yeah yeah, man, that that future tech, uh, medical technology is yeah. kind of awesome. <laughs> it's everything, you know. With with Zero's new body, you know, they say it's it's basically a, a, just a new version of the old containment suit. Uh, mm-hmm. and so maybe body's not even right the, the right word, but it's a new version. It has sensory inputs that's supposed to be 
this big change, but would not the old suit have had some some need for contact with the outside world and, and something that we would call in that way sensory inputs? You would need pressure sensors at a minimum in order yeah. to navigate mm-hmm. space. Right. So he had to have those yeah. and they're making it sound like it didn't, but it had yeah. to. Yeah. Right. And then Jane always says everyone's going to have to adapt to this this new suit. But I'm like, well, no, this is just where we were a few episodes ago. Just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, right. I, frankly, I'm glad they put it back, though, because, mm-hmm. I, you know, it, seeing him as the big, tall, green guy was mm-hmm. OK. Mm-hmm. But um, but you've invested, you know, thinking from a production mm-hmm. standpoint, mm-hmm. you've invested the whole first season and, you know, basically, you know, I guess the first half. half of this season yeah. with him looking one way. Mm-hmm. And then you have this radically different thing and to have him permanently look different would be a little much for a kid show. I think. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It, I mean, the, the look of zero is a key element to, I think the look of the show. I mean, it just, it's, you know, when you see the cast uh, and it makes him different, it makes him, and there are plenty of tall gangly funny colored aliens in star trek but this him in the encounter suit makes him different it makes him and he has interesting capabilities that he had lost by being in the body so uh, i'm glad it it opens up story possibilities to put him back inside so i think that's that's fine um anything else we want to say about this episode anything we didn't cover brother just one little line i enjoyed and a few little uh, quotes are always interesting, but when Magell is asked about their their chances in the battle, and she says, I will decline to answer for purposes of morale. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that was nice. <laughs> Never tell me the odds. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy, how about you? Nope. Very good. Well, let's move on to our feedback, because I promised that earlier. Uh, the first bit of feedback comes from uh, our bonus episode that we had this past week, as if you're listening to this uh, as we release. Uh, it was a patron special episode that we've released to our general audience to show you the benefits of being a patron. Father Corey and I recorded this some time back about the Discovery Season 5, and so we have a truly awesome New Mexico Catholic on our YouTube channel write, great episode, still no desire to see any Discovery, good to see Father Corey again, I hope he's doing well. And uh, he is, uh, thanks for asking, uh, he, he reports all as well. Uh, but yeah, we, we, as we, as Father Corey and I always said, we watch it so you don't have to. <laughs> actually, actually our, uh, our, our conclusion was season five was good. It was probably the second best season after season two of Discovery. Not a high bar, but you know, still, <laughs> it was pretty good. And, uh, and then on our last Prodigy episode, Cracked Mirror, uh, truly awesome, also says, Finally, something I can agree with you guys on about DS9, the Mirror episodes. In my opinion, they didn't capture what was cool about the Mirror Universe, nor what was cool about DS9. Just a big misfire. Also, Dark Mirror is an awesome Enterprise episode. Anyway, keep up the good work. Really appreciate your discussions. In a Mirror Darkly. Yeah, it is really good. Yeah. Yeah. In a, that's right. In a Mirror Darkly. Yeah, it was... It, it was very different from every other Mirror Universe episode, and that's one of the things that made it really cool. And that was one of the sad things about Enterprise not getting that fifth season, is that I think they were going to explore that universe a bit more mm. in the fifth season mm-hmm. of Enterprise. That would have been cool. I liked how they, they showed us what could be, not has to be, but what could be the divergent point that split the Mirror Universe, mm-hmm. where in Star Trek First Contact, Zephram Cochran pulls a gun on the landing Vulcans. Yeah. And and then actually it can't be the beginning because they sh- I don't think because they they have completely different credits for those two episodes that are based on the credits we see uh, for most Enterprise episodes, but they're much more militaristic. So we right. see instead mm-hmm. of the development of spaceflight, we see the development of military technology in spaceflight. Yep. And and um, it's it, it, that's just such a fun pair of episodes. Can't wait to we get to see those. Uh, we to talk about them because uh, those yeah we, those are. We also they're... finally get to see a, a full Tholian in it. Mm. Right, man, and then Doctor Flox kills it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen those. Uh, yeah. I, I wanted. To, can't wait. 
Uh, all right, so those are uh, that's our feedback this time, and we really do appreciate uh, this, if anyone sending in feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And now we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it for us this time. What did you think of Ascension parts one and two? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash Trek our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia, send an email to trek at sqpn.com or visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash Discord, or you can watch The Secrets of Star Trek on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia and leave a comment there after uh, giving us a thumbs up and subscribing as well. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next episode of a Prodigy called Brink. Until then, Father Jason Tyler, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thanks, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on Star Quest, and remember to quote Murph. Pew 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 pew!